I'm uh, going to try to do several things here in the next 45 minutes. Um, I'm up for manufacturing, and I don't learn. I came out of manufacturing. Manufacturing is always trying to figure out how to do multiple things at the same time, parallel process. I don't know if you experience this when I cook in my kitchen. Uh, every time I touch something, I put it away. Uh, if I make a move and I make it twice, I kind of am mad at myself, so I try to figure out how to go from maybe the toaster to the, um, or to the refrigerator and get as many things as I can when I go back to the toaster. My wife is totally different. My wife doesn't throw, doesn't put anything away. Flowers all over the place. And so we don't survive very well in the kitchen. The point being here is that when I uh, talk to you today, I'm going to try to deliver maybe three or four points at the same time. The uh, first point that I obviously want to make is that uh, this couldn't be done without you. I appreciate Mr. Baker saying that this is started here. It has been started in the hearts of many, many people. All right, Bo and I are very seldom in agreement on anything. The one thing we did agree upon is that when the book came out, it wasn't necessarily about rocket science, it just touched a lot of hearts, okay? It just touched a lot of things inside of people that they really kind of felt it was the right, and the right thing to do. And uh, so I have to tell you, and I was telling John at the table earlier, that uh, you have no idea what we get from you. I mean, I can come up here and I can tell you where we're at and I can tell you, you know, because I'm still an operating CEO, we have a living laboratory, we practice it every single day, I can tell you where, what we learned, what we, mistakes we made, okay. Uh, but a lot of times I can come here and just tell you what my biggest problem is and then by the end of this conference you solve it for me. You don't know that you are a vast wealth of knowledge and if you don't realize that, you need to be talking to the people next to you because this is a tremendously outstanding group of people who lead with their hearts, all right, that really are here to do, to do and learn and to do the right thing. So one of the things I wanna do is, is basically kinda of just give us a, a refresher course uh, in terms of the business. And uh, I think many of you have seen this before. This is kind of a really simple way of trying to explain what the great game of business is. It's just three interchanging circles and it has this point in the middle of the circles where they all emerge. I think one of the things that's interesting is there's a lot of definitions in terms of the critical number and I'd like to clarify that after I touch on some of the macro elements of the bigger circles, okay? The first circle is obviously we've always believed that if someone's going to come into one of our businesses, it would be a really good idea to tell them what business they're in. I mean, not only from the standpoint of their skill sets, but also who do they compete against, all right? You know, some people don't like to use sports as an analogy, but, you know, it's really simple to say that if you're going to play any kind of a game or any kind of sports, it's probably a very good idea that you know the directions, you know the rules, and things of this nature. And we have a tremendously intense process in terms of mind dating as much as we possibly can relative to markets, relative to competitors, relative to, you know, what are we gonna do to be able to win in that particular area? Once we set up the metrics, once we set up the parameters, okay, now we gotta figure out how to communicate the information to the people. How do we convert the stories into the numbers? How do people understand the numbers? How do the people believe the numbers uh, that we're giving them? And we came to the conclusion a long time ago that the only way we can get them to believe the numbers is for them to submit the numbers to us. And it's ironic to see just how hard people are on, them, are on themselves. And many times we're faced with kind of trying to slow it down, even though we've provided them all the data in circle one, which will tell them which are the best in class, what are the highest metrics, all right, who's outperforming in terms of the marketplace. But time after time again, our people will come in and try to exceed that. We kind of slow it down with providing a stake in the outcome. We said, look, you know, we just believe that we've got to be at top of our class relative to the market. We benchmark our, a lot of, a lot of our, our, our compensation programs, our benefit programs, to be as high in the market space as we possibly can. 
And then we believe that anything in excess of that, all right, if you beat the market, they deserve better than markets. So we now have incentive programs. And, and I'm, you know, I'm giving you a, a kind of a view of this at a 40,000 foot level, okay? I mean, that's what its simplicity is, all right? Give them the directions of monopoly, you know, obviously start playing the game. Everybody understands what their, what their net worth is in a program of that nature. And then obviously left standing is the person that made the right property decisions in the course of the game, somebody of that nature. Okay, so that's the overview. What I really want to kind of get to is a critical number because people use critical numbers for a lot of different reasons. You can use your critical number for any reason you want. Right, we use a critical number for one specific purpose. Once we accumulate all the data from the people and we've talked to the people and they've laid out their strategic plans, okay, and they've laid out their financial ratios for a given year, we take all those financial ratios together and we huddle in a room and we say to ourselves, what is the one number that can take us out? What can beat us the most, all right? I mean, critical is critical is critical is critical, all right? You know, I'm proud to say that this year we're having record level of activities in almost every single element of all the financials across the board. I mean, our critical number is not sales. Our critical number is not earnings. Our critical number this year is not cash flow. I know this is not arrogant, I am not bragging, this is done by the people inside of our organization. Because I believe that the critical numbers in most organizations change quite frequently, whereas many of most companies will keep a profit sharing program for a real long period of time. We found out early in our careers that profit sharing programs get bored, boring, they don't communicate things, a lot of people don't understand where they get them. You miss the education process by not having the right critical number uh, the opportunity to be able to communicate, to learn, to achieve, to celebrate. But more importantly, what we look for in terms of the critical number, what is the long-term effect? What's the one that could take us out? I see a lot of operations and I, they know what their critical number is, but they're more focused maybe on net income or maybe they're focused on cash flow. But I also don't think that in a lot of cases they don't have the courage to really attack the critical number. I mean, I, when we see our, watch our people, and the great game people working with new people. I mean, it's like, we'll just start anywhere. Just start with a number and get everybody behind it and then this is the beginning of it. And we debated a long time ago, do you start out with knowing to teach the rules first or do you really go back into a stake in the outcome? And you know, I've always been a believer is give them the big picture, give them the, the statistics, okay. And let talk about the vulnerabilities. Let's put the vulnerabilities on the table and then let's use that third cycle in terms of risks and reward. And if in fact they're able to overcome the numbers, you know, then we can make certain that we're secure over a long period of time. We talked a long term yesterday, I went to break into groups in terms of our forecasting techniques and we're kind of obsessed with our ability to be able to forecast so far out and so accurately. Our forecasting technically runs almost in the 96th percentile from actual to plan on an annual basis, which is remarkable. Over the last five years, our earnings based on our forecast, when you go back and look at the actuals to plan, are now running at something in 93% accuracy and they would have been in the 96% accuracy had not the barrel of oil dropped from $100 a barrel to 50 which we didn't have in terms of our analysis, knowing the rules of the game. Although we did know that if you're gonna play in the oil industry, it's boom or it's bust. And it's really seductive. And they're really, really high margins. We got greedy and we had no contingencies and we went in, in there and about the year 2014 or 15, we ended up right now at $7 million after we massaged ourselves with those earnings in the three previous years. But had we hit that number, the accuracy which comes from the people inside of the organization is almost at 96% of the top line, 96% of the time. Mean, that is a very, very powerful metric. We often believe that if we can accurately forecast, we can control our business. Sometimes we say we can control the world if you can figure out how to forecast, that you know what's coming, that you can see around cars. And you do that by this obsessiveness in terms of the data that you mine constantly, you mine daily, you mine on every sales call, you mine at the gathering and the information that you can take from everybody else. 
So one of the things I really wanted to do is put this emphasis on this critical number. All right? I mean, for 35 years, I can't tell you the number of critical numbers we had, but we've had a multitude, over 50% differences in critical numbers. We've had a critical number recently, okay, to build a war chest because we think there's a downturn in 19. Many of you heard this, you know, and it's kind of a comical joke. I've been forecasting a recession in 19 for 10 years. People are wanting to see whether it's going to happen or not. They hope that it doesn't happen or not. I don't care if it happens or not <laughs> because we're prepared for it. I mean, we are actually trying to look, at, we've been through four recessions, so we've got quite a history. We also know if we're well prepared for a recession, things go cheaper. Prices of businesses are extraordinarily high right now. Buildings are high right now. Commercial properties are high right now. Expansion is extraordinarily difficult for us because the economy is roaring. It's exploding. It's not roaring, it's exploding. And these are not the necessarily times for our company to make really good strategic moves, so we pay a lot of attention to the business that we have on hand, and we go to bed at night with one eye open looking for opportunities, but more importantly, looking for opportunities when there's a downturn, because we have been able to grow the value of our company five years after every recession, We've been through four recessions, so it only makes sense for us that we start saving a little money, that if in fact there is a recession, that we can buy buildings at a cheap price, we can look at businesses at a lower multiples, and we can expand our businesses a lot easier than it is in a very, very expensive period of time. So we don't really fear it, okay? And I don't think the recession in 19 is gonna be very, very long, but I've always predicated this forecast on one simple uh, philosophy, and it was a philosophy that I really learned in the 1970s. Um, we had the opportunity in the 1970s when we were going through high interest rates and slowing of economies and the Fed was dominating in terms of what was happening in the marketplace, and we got a chance to listen to Alan Greenspan, and some of us really needed some help in trying to understand when the Fed makes decisions that have tremendously impacts on the economy. And we said to them, so look, we don't understand M1 money and M2 money or M3 money and M5 money. We don't understand how this works and this works. Could you give me three simple reasons on how we should be looking at the economy? How do you guys forecast? You know, we'd like to take that information back and we'd like to work in some of our plans. He said, well, he said, this is a kind of a simple way of looking at it in terms of the future. He said, we see a hot economy when we look at three issues, okay? One of those issues, and this is real simple stuff, one is the unemployment rate, right? So we're running at an all-time unemployment rate in Springfield, Missouri at 2.8%. I think under anything under five is a danger zone. The second thing he said is that we look at number of hours worked. And number of hours in a work week, and it typically from 2009 to like 2016, it was well into the low, mid-30s, okay? So in other words, the average associate in the United States today was running an average of maybe 35 hours. But if that 35 goes to 41, it goes to 42, we know it's a hot economy, it's expanding, we can statistically see it. I don't know about you guys, whether you're working a lot of overtime hours or not, okay, but we are. I mean, we're one of the most difficult things that we're experiencing right now is this tremendous jump in terms of a GDP that went from 1.6% to now in the fours. I often kid a lot of people that when our government tries to stimulate an economy, they're so bad at math, they think 1.6 to 4 is only a 2.4% increase. In a manufacturing facility that's pretty dedicated and that is all involved in the GDP, we've almost got to double the size of our business to be able to handle that 4% increase in the GDP. And the third thing that Greenspan said, which I think was, was the most remarkable, he says, you know, watch how long it takes to get things. I don't know if each and every one of you had ever had the experience in terms of buying parts or being in the purchasing department, but our lead time parts now is in some cases almost 180 days and it continually goes out. The lead times of parts. I remember early in the spring trying to buy some lawn furniture and the delivery promise was November. Well, it gets a little cold in November in Springfield, Missouri, all right? 
I even went to a deli not too long ago and he just came back from St. Louis and he couldn't get the oil for his salad and he was screaming the fact that the delivery was now six months out and he didn't know how he was gonna meet his demand. Behind scheduled conditions occur because you can't get components, okay? You're not getting them out on time. I talked to a person that, uh, that makes Kenworth big class A trucks. There are 22,000 trucks behind schedule right now just in their queue because the lead times of the parts and the capacity that av is available. So they ta taught us that those are the three things that you look for in terms of trying to figure out where the market's going to be, where the economy's going to be, where you need to be in terms of three years, four years, five years, ten years down the road. Well, after four years of recessions that occurred over a ten-year period of time, and taking into consideration all the stimulation that was going to occur in the economy, it was pretty safe to say that we're going to look at this thing slowly coming back at 09, ramping up at a certain pace. But if we're not prepared for the ramp up in the space, we're going to have severe motivational problems inside of our organization. And the most, and the most significant number is going to be the fact that uh, I'm doing really well with this one. Can I get some help from the higher authorities? Like, you guys are God. <laughs> Can you hit me on three? Okay, whoop, whoop, whoop. Give me three. All right, now they know this is eye boggling, right? And so is death by PowerPoint, all right? And so I don't expect you to understand or see anything of this nature. What I want to tell you in a phase two of my message to you guys is it's becoming quite apparent that our critical number now is people. It's just so ironic that we started 35 years and we bought our jobs because we were in the midst of a recession and we got laid off. And we are so obsessively focused with jobs for 35 years, we always have held people first. We've always made certain compensations were reasonable. We promoted people with the ability that if in fact they failed, we always created a safe landing for them. I mean, we were really, really sensitive because we didn't want to be able to put anybody in terms of a layoff position. And to this day, we've been very fortunate to have that at the most minimal level that anyone could ever experience. We respect the value of a job. In Springfield, Missouri in 1983, they did not have jobs. Our unemployment rate was 12%. I mean, we were tremendously influenced at the very beginning of making absolutely certain that we didn't close the factory. We made some acquisitions in 09 because we found that some factories were closing and there was a, people that were extraordinarily talented, so we made an acquisition relative to the talent of the people. So our priority all these years was people. Never once in the 35 years did we ever think about our people as being the critical number because we always thought we were doing the right things. And the left-hand column is attrition, all right? When you go from that 1.6 and you go to that 4% GDP, you explode. It took us 18 months, and just last Friday, we were able to at least staff our company to a reasonable level so we could stop working overtime because the morale was deteriorating so bad in our company because we couldn't find people fast enough to meet the orders. I know that sounds like, a, like I'm whining, right? Like, you know, you're whining about sales, all right? That you're whining and you're complaining about, you know, uh, opportunities that you have. But when you live in Springfield, Missouri and your, your primary, your primary love is hunting and fishing and being with your family, and you're working consecutive Saturdays and some kinds of Sundays, you've got to be able to make radical changes. And we have made radical changes, all right? I mean, as good as we try to think we are, our turnover rate is about 24, 25%. Now you would sit there and say, well, geez, if you play the great game of business and use all these benefits and things of this nature, but a lot of that 24% has been built into the way we've been able to run our companies. In other words, we have six colleges in our city. We started a kidding company, so we allow the students to be able to sign in any time between 7 and 11. At 7 in the morning they can come in, we kit over 300,000 kits a year. 
All right, so this gives them the opportunity to go to college, work their hours in, put some hours in, flex times. This whole 24% includes, you know, temporary people in terms of agencies. Uh, basically, we looked at ways to make absolutely certain that we didn't necessarily have a layoff for our full time of people. We moved a lot of people who left the college scene and wanted to come back. A lot of them became supervisors inside of our organization. So this particular program worked really, really well for us. But it really worked well for us because you know, we could continually replace the number of people that were leaving because the job market had resources to replace the people. How many people in this room right now are ha having trouble getting people? Quite a few. We're so much like you. How many people really believe that this could be the number one critical problem in the next 24 months? Slows your business down, puts pressure on your people, put pressure on your customers, okay? I mean, this slowly came up to me, okay? I mean, it's slowly, I mean, we have Job security is number one. You know, we believe in Maslow's hierarchy of need. I mean, 24 consecutive years, we've gotten outstanding awards for, from our government in terms of having safety programs and creating the greatest, safest place to work. We communicate through our great game of business. I, we do the huddles, we do the bonuses. We have big, big parties. We just celebrated 35 years. We had the Beach Boys and, who was the other one? Chicago. 4,000 people came to our celebrations, all right? We try to make this a cool place to work. And then all of a sudden, you gotta start hiring people, right? And you start bringing in new people. And before you look at it, I did a number the other day, we have now 740 people out of 1,812 people that have been here less than 36 months. We got a whole new group of people. We got a whole new group of young people, all right? But the point of the matter is we have been able to attract those people because of the programs that we have inside of our organization because we understand the millenniums. We understand that when the millenniums want to come to work, they want to make a difference. And one of the nice things about our culture is if you got the you got to want it, you can make a difference inside the organization. If you want to go to tuition refund and you want to go to college, you want to be a PhD, we'll pay for your PhD, all right? I mean, there really is no reason, if, if you really have any interest in getting in manufacturing, and I know that it's a dirty word in a lot of situations, that you could have a career, you could have a future, you could look forward to it. We'll give you financial training, skills training, all right? We, we, we have a, a, a healthcare program by far, is far outweighs any competition in terms of art. So we thought we had it, all right? We thought we had it made. And then all of a sudden, we began to realize that the market's not there. The people's not there. At a 1.6% growth factor, we could live with this, this kind of model. In a 4% growth factor, we can't live within this model. Let me just give you some crazy numbers, and they all say I love numbers, but boy, I'll tell you one thing, you can't beat the facts. And one thing scary about the facts is that they hit you right between the eyes. Now, you got a choice. You can either believe the facts and do something about it, or you can believe the facts, or you can put your head in the sand. So just here's some of the facts. Our on roll went from 1,436 people at the beginning of 2016 to 1,812 people by 2018. All right? But that's not the hidden numbers. If you apply this this methodology by which we bring people in and we bring people out and you take the flex times and you take the temporary help and the kids from the colleges and things of this nature, and you really want to apply a 25% turnover rate, all right, that means that you've really got to bring in somewhere in the vicinity, and, and I'll just read these, these numbers to you, all right? So of the people that we brought in from 1,436 to 1,812, all right, we terminated, we lost, we, we they self-left. I mean, whatever you want to call turnover, all right, and again, it's relative to each program, 
We lost 328 people in 16, 319 people in 17, 362 people. We added 376, which I told you between 16 and 18. That means we hired 1,385 people in 36 months. How do you run a business like that? Well, thankfully, we've got tremendously skilled labor, talent, people. We've got programs. We've lived within this structure for a long period of time. And we've been very fortunate to be able to hang on. And that's what we've done, all right? We've met our customer expectations. Our quality has been very good. Our behind schedule is getting up. But now what happens when you forecast an 8% growth? Go back to that three circles, and our sales and marketing people tell us the rules, and they're going to tell us that 8.8% is what we're forecasting compounded for the next five years. So now I start doing a math, all right? Now all of a sudden, our 1812 on an 8% increase is going to go to 1956, and by the year 2022, it's going to go to 2,465 people. I mean, just to meet our 8% growth on the, eight, on, on the 1,800 people, we gotta find someone like 653 people just to handle the growth. Anybody thinking about the attrition? So we got 653 to grow, now all of a sudden we gotta figure out how to handle the attrition if we apply a 25% attrition rate. We gotta hire 2,086 people just to handle trans, just the turnover, just the transition. Is that a number that would scare you? I mean, is that a number that you would define as critical? Is that a number that will wake you and shake you to your core, even though you have done an incredible job from the attrition rate? So what do you think our new critical number is? You know, it's not sales, it's not earnings, it's not cash flow, it's now people. What an irony, right? I mean, people is all your best asset. You think you're doing everything well, and then all of a sudden, you reach an economic boom. And then the demographics and the economic boom work against you. Anybody hear about how many baby boomers are leaving the market on a daily basis? 10,000. And that's been going on for some time, and that has been baked into these attrition numbers but eventually the well runs dry when that 10,000 is gonna last until 2030. So the availability is gonna be somewhat shrinking. Now we got some other problems too. I mean, some of the problems that we have is that uh, you know, not too many people want their kids to go into manufacturing. And listen, we have a lot of different businesses. I'm not saying, and I don't want you to think that this only applies to manufacturing because we do have service, we have technology, and we have distribution companies, but I'm only using manufacturing because they have the lowest opportunity, the biggest challenge in today's marketplace. In other words, 70% of the people think that we need manufacturing to raise the middle class, to cut the gap, all right? Unfortunately, less than 17% of their, the adults want to send their kids into manufacturing. When you go into the school systems, the basic phrase is, get yourself a degree so you don't have to end up in a factory. That's the pool that we are dealing with in our organization. So let me tell you what happens when you get a critical number. If you got the right critical number, you shred it. You tear it apart. You just look at every single compounded fraction, total, complete number. I mean, you tear down your policies and you become obsessed with a critical number because you know that that is going to be the number that's gonna take you out over the long term, and I'm gonna keep repeating what a critical number is, all right? Because that's when all of a sudden you get the people engaged. Now we begin to find out what we gotta do. Not only do we have to figure out how do we attract, but basically we gotta figure out how to retain. Our new number in terms of retention, and I'm still arm wrestling with our people, is I want to see it at 10. They don't think they, they can, they believe they can get to 15. And in some cases, we have been able to get to 15.
But we are spending, we are investing a tremendous amount of money trying to figure out how to bridge that gap, how not necessarily to be the employer choice, okay, but to be able to create a business by which people can see that this is a lifestyle, this is a career path. And I'll give you these, these are all available. I don't expect you to read them, okay? But on the right side are all the things that we have done and we've initiated in the last months to be able to tr create an attraction program inside of our organization. In this particular case, you know, we started what we would call a third grader goes to work program because the teachers told us at that time that you influence the child by the time they're in third grade. So what we did is we would get the buses and the lunches and then we would go to the schools and we would speak to the students. We'd tell them what they were going to see. We told them that, what dress codes that we had. We gave them job applications. They filled them out. They had to get references from their parents about how good kids were. You know, we brought them into the factories. Um, we sat down and did job interviews with them. We told them the importance of handwriting. We told them the importance of why you got to fill out an application. And then we took them out onto the plant tours to see what a manufacturing facility looked like. And who do you think was the most important person in most cases on that factory floor? Anybody know? Yeah, well, Donna, you know this. Forklift, Donna told me, the forklift truck driver. And what an unbelievable experience when a third grader goes up to a machine operator, and you could pick the worst machine operator in the world, load them up with sodium pentothal, may hate the company, but do you really think they're gonna tell a third grader you know, how bad it is, or, you know, the, the, the work rate. And we got a twofer on that program, all right? But that wasn't enough. So then we decided, well, okay, you know, what we've got to do is we've got to get into the high schools. And so they put together a place, a thing called Go Caps that was invented, I think, in Kansas City, we brought to Springfield. 17 school districts got together and said, let's have classrooms, let's have degrees, let's have curriculums as close to the businesses that we possibly can. So we took one of our companies and we opened up our doors and we provided classrooms and security systems and technology to be able to actually have manufacturing classes, engineering classes right in the business. And then from the business, we had the capacity to do 40 to 50 kids on the first in the morning classes, 40 to 50 on the second classes. And what we did is we ran them into all processes and procedures, taught, taught them about all the differences in terms of what manufacturing was all about. And they took it for a full semester. They got credit for high school. They got credit for college. We ran it for a three-year period of time. We ran 200 to 300 people through there. And how many hires do you think we got at that particular point in time? Four. <laughs> you know why? You know who goes to those programs? The bright flight. <laughs> All right. The kids that are already in the A-plus program, okay? the kids that already are got their eyes set on medical school or technology or something of this nature. I mean, what we were trying to get was the C students. I told the groups yesterday that one of the most impressive things I did one time was talk at Ball State. And when I was at Ball State in Indiana, I noticed that uh, David Letterman had provided a scholarship fund for C students. So how smart was that? <laughs> and so how are we going to get to the C students? So then we started to go down the distribution channel. We went through the superintendents and then we went to the teachers and the teachers, when we would bring them into our factory floors, the only thing they could say is, my God, this is clean. We didn't even know that this was really going on. We went to the counselors and we talked to the counselors, all right, and we talked about, do you have career paths? Are you talking to people? And you know, we're trying to route this thing back in terms of trying to change the place of work. And the counselors are too busy taking care of kids. We got behavioral problems, we got drug problems, and we kind of shifted away from the things. And so we, and we literally brought hundreds and hundreds of people through the organizations and provided as much information as we possibly can, and then, we finally realized in one meeting that we had off-site that you gotta get to the parents. <laughs> we as business people gotta get to the parents. We gotta change the perception of the parents who believe 70% of our middle class gap can be solved in manufacturing, but my kid doesn't really need to go there and we've gotta to explain to them, how would you like to send your kid 
to college debt free. We gotta market ourselves in a different way than we've ever marketed them in the past. We gotta talk to some football coaches or high school coaches, okay, that have done recruiting you know, in the home. We gotta be careful in terms of our social media because there's a good side and a bad side, I don't know. John told me his glass door is absolutely perfect. What a remarkable thing. But glass doors can be just as dangerous. Social media, we've gotta be careful because at again a given time, an irate associate can set up their own webpage and literally terrorize you and send out false warnings that you have no chance to defend yourself. So we have to be able to become aware all right. We're deep into the community, but we've got to become deeper in the community in order to be able to make absolutely certain that we can start and we can increase. We may have to end up buying companies that have people and look at it from a totally different standpoint. But nothing's not on the table. Nothing at all. Healthcare programs, babysitting programs, Someone just told me today that 70% of the millenniums would like to go to work and bring their dog. <laughs> I don't think we're gonna go there. <laughs> we might, I, mean, I don't know. <laughs> we might. But am I scaring you? How many people am I scaring? All right, you don't have the impact of the critical number yet, all right? So the number to us is extraordinarily critical. It's so ironic, again, that we've got to revamp our entire outlook in terms of the people, the environment. Our buildings have got to be able to change. We've got to make it more friendly than we've ever made it before. We've got to make it more fun. We don't, well, we only have one ping pong table in 20 of the factories. So maybe we've got to get more ping pong tables and look at the best practices of the Googles and the and the, and the people that are, for some reason, attracting you know, this significant amount of people. Oh yeah, we got employee ownership. I'll tell you, you're there for a long period of time. You really make it, but teaching a kid that it's all about long-term patient capital, it's all about hard work, they just don't buy it in those early years. So we gotta figure out how to communicate, how do we get to them, we gotta, now onboarding programs. You know, our people are so mad at us in terms of the number of hours worked, all right, we eventually had to go to them and say, look, if you are that mad, go out and find somebody that we can hire. We've got to get everybody in the company focused on the critical number because that's the purpose of the critical number. And if you're getting tired of me sitting there talking about the critical number, then I've finally got my parallel process down. I'm explaining to you what it is that affects the long-term viability and safety of the company going forward, all right? making absolutely certain that you've got the courage and the guts to do something about it, shredding it down into its most simplistic thing, looking under every single table that you possibly can to seek answers to what I think is going to be a war on talent or a war for talent. And we're all going to be competing against each other in a small, small labor pool. Right now there are 6.3 million jobs open in the United States today. In less than 24 months, they're forecasting that to go to 8.5 million. In that 8.5 million, 3.5 million are manufacturing jobs in the United States. We need to get a fraction of that in order to make absolutely certain that we can sustain the growth, have the opportunities, and to be able to grab the brass ring. In conclusion, I will tell you what I just, my gut tells me today. Those of us that have the most outstanding workforces by the year 2020 will dominate your markets. That the valuations of companies will change from not only multiples on earnings, book value multiples, uh, strategic models, to looking who has the most valuable assets, and that's people. So if I've done my job here today, it's one to express to you the power, to express to you how a critical number works, 
but more importantly, to understand that a critical number can actually bring everybody together and everybody can do something about it. This is just the beginning of all the things that we're doing now to attain, to attract. We've now set the goals in terms of where we really need. We'll put incentive programs out there. We're actually up to now having a finder's fee per employee at $2,500. That didn't sit too well. But if you told somebody that they could have a Saturday, we could get back to normal hours, that we are really doing everything we possibly can and we need your help in order to attain it, your understanding, okay, how you can do many, many things within one, one critical number and solve so many problems at the same time. I don't think it's gonna be that expensive. I mean, we'll match wages, all right, but we'll pass wages on to the marketplace. I mean, what, what we know right now is that we will figure out what the compensation is. And compensation is basically based on any kind of an increase in productivity and any increase in inflation. One of the worst things in our United States today is that we've only had a 1% improvement in terms of productivity. So we have chances in terms of productivity to require less people if we can figure out how to get much smarter in terms of the things we did. So let me just leave you one, one interesting quote that I've already said before. Those of us that have the workforce, those of us that have the people, uh, will dominate their space in the next 24 months. Thank you. Mm -hmm.